But having done that, I then made the mistake of looking at the list of speakers and topics and said, holy cow, how the heck am I going to be able to add anything to that? I mean, I, I just can't believe the variety of topics, the quality of the speakers, the, uh, the, the degree of uh, focus that they're bringing to their topics. And, you know, I looked at that list and I realized I was something of a minority for a couple of reasons. First, I was one of the few who had the timidity to write a book about the entire battle, a single book about the entire battle. And after I wrote that book, I went on and I did other subjects. I, uh, I marched with Sherman from uh, Atlanta to Savannah. And I looked over the shoulder of Robert E. Lee throughout the entire Civil War. And currently, I'm spending a lot of close personal time with Abraham Lincoln in uh, two of the last weeks of his life in March and April of 1865. So I realized that things I learned when I did the Gettysburg book actually came more to the fore as I moved on and did those other books. And I said, well, that's something I guess I can talk about, and who knows, it may even be interesting. So uh, we'll, 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 we'll give it a f trial here, and we'll see how we do it. Now when I was, and you'll forgive me if time and again, again, some authors, you know, Ed Bars has a, a, a brain that must reach. <laughs> Mine is sort of stacked like a computer. That is, I've got the old files, which are the Gettysburg files, the not so old files with the Sherman files, the little less older files, which are the Lee files, and the fresh files, which are the Lincoln files. So if I reach for stories, it's apt to go to the Lincoln pile rather than the Gettysburg pile, but, but we'll see what we can do here. I was in the, the thick of my research on Lincoln. You know, sometimes for a, a, an author, your subconscious will direct you somewhere, and you won't really kind of figure it out for a while. And I found that as much as I was reading up of various accounts of Lincoln's time on those two weeks, I was also reading a lot of Roman military history. And I, and I just couldn't understand why. I just couldn't put those, those books down. And then I came across a, a, a good-sized history. We're talking like 300 pages. On the Battle of Mons Gropius, which took place in Scotland 82 years after the death of Christ. And in it, the Roman army crushed any last real rebellion in Britain. But in the author takes a section where he has to say that 90% of what he's telling me comes from a single source. In this case, a Roman historian called Tacitus. That got me thinking about a lot of the stories that are told to you in occasions like this that you read about in uh, histories and uh, articles. And I, I had a moment there and I realized that a, a decent percentage of those are what we would call single source stories. They exist because the author says they happened. If you go and try to corroborate it, it's almost often impossible. And, and really think about it, if this person came into a major news operation and pitched this story, and they could say, oh, well, what do you have to back it up? And he says, well, I was there. I saw it. They said, yeah, but what have you got to back it up? And the answer is nothing but their word. And so, you know, a little like that uh, stage with the, with the hay, a lot of narrative histories have a lot of these stories in very strategic places where you, have, you realize that everything depends on the veracity of that one particular source, because there's no one that can double check them. And that really got me looking hard at the sources that I really learned to count on. And I want to give you a for instance here, and again, you'll, you'll forgive me. It's got Lincoln in the story, so that, that gets a Gettysburg connection. Uh, but the rest of it's going to have to do with uh, 1865. Quick background to the story I'm working on now. 
March 23rd, 1865, in response to an invitation from Ulysses S. Grant, President Abraham Lincoln, his wife, and his son Tad leave the White House, get on board a rented steamship called the River Queen, travel down the Potomac, Chesapeake, up the James River, and go to City Point, Virginia, which at that point in time is the headquarters of the armies of the United States. He plans to stay there for four days. He winds up staying there 16 days. This becomes, an, I'm not giving away the punchline of my book, but to my mind, this becomes a very profound experience for the president. We tell this story from a number of key witnesses, and one of the most often quoted uh, is the admiral in charge of the uh, North Atlantic Blockading Squadron, who also is responsible for the James River, a fellow named David Dixon Porter. I know for a fact he was there when Lincoln was there. We know that. Porter, I think, is honestly a, a naval hero of the war, a courageous commander. He's also a guy who loved to tell a good tale. And uh, he wrote, he's one of these guys, you realize, they write a series of memoirs, often touching the same story, and each time that they do, the story gets better. The quotes get longer, the descriptions get more colorful, and uh, I quickly figured out that I have to take a little more than a grain of salt and see if I can sort out how truthful Porter is on some of these stories, which were written 15 to 20 years after the fact. Now, I'm going to tell you, I think, what is the most famous Lincoln story to come out of Porter's memoirs, and I suspect that some of you will have heard this one before. And it's a good story. That's the whole thing. Now, Porter's flagship is called the, is the USS Malvern. Now, as he tells the story, one day the president's ship, the River Queen, had to leave City Point, go to Norfolk for a couple of days. So Lincoln bunks aboard the Admiral's flagship. Well, Porter tells us how small the flagship is and how modest the accommodations are. And he only really has like his secretary's bunk space to give to the president. But the president says, that's fine, I'll take it. So the first night he's on board, he goes to bed. And as Porter's going to bed, he walks past the door and he realizes that the president had put his shoes outside the door and his socks. Porter looks at the socks and sees that there's some holes in the socks. And he also sees that the shoes are pretty beat up. So he calls over one of the sailors. The sailors take them away overnight. They darn the socks and they polish the shoes up. Well, they're having breakfast the next morning and Lincoln says, Admiral, an amazing thing happened last night. He says, I put my shoes and my socks out the door and when they came back, the holes were fixed and the shoes looked great. So Porter smiled and asked him, did he sleep well? And here Lincoln said it was okay. Then he made a joke about trying to fit a long sword into a small scabbard. And at that point, Porter says, uh-oh, the bunk is six feet, Lincoln's six feet four. So according to Porter, during the day, Lincoln goes on shore, Porter brings in carpenters. They don't just make the bunk bigger, they make the room bigger and wider. And he doesn't say a thing. And the next morning, Lincoln says, an even grading miracle happened. I shrunk four inches and got two inches short, uh, narrower last night. Well, it's a great story. And trust me, it's all over the place in books about Lincoln at City Point. All right, I said, how can I check this out? Well, thanks to the National Archives, I have access to the original deck logs of the USS Malvern. And they chart the president's comings and goings. And there's only one night where he spends aboard the ship, not two, like Porter claims. And secondly, there's no notation of any major carpentry operation that's going on. Plus, I keep fairly tr close track on the River Queen, and there's no two or three days. She never leaves City Point except to go to Richmond twice. So I have to, I take it all and I have to shake my head and say, oh, David Porter, 
you're pulling a fast one on all of us. So my conclusion was, it was something Porter made up to improve the quality of his story. But I think this is, is a lesson to tell us that I think if you're on a tour and hear a great story told, uh, you're reading a book and come across a good story, I think we all have respons- I think as historians we have responsibilities to make sure if we can't corroborate it, we have to at least be reasonably sure there's a likelihood it could have happened. And I think any good guide, any good historian would be happy to explain the, the choices they make in sources. And that's, you know, for a book like Gettysburg, trust me, you make a lot of choices. There's a lot to believe and not to believe. Um, I, on one occasion, I, like, I would say that if you read in um, Freeman's biography, Robert E. Lee, the section on Gettysburg, read it for the footnotes. Don't read it for the narrative. He had an ad- agenda that he picked up from the soldiers and he just rolls it out there and he's got people who testify that some of the testimony we know for sure was false and as a result uh, it's, a, it's an unfortunately marred section. So, you know, when you tackle something like Gettysburg, you, it's like a minefield. You've got to really step carefully and you've always got to double ask yourself, is there another reason this guy is telling this story? Uh, let me give you another for instance, and again, I'll, I'll have to fall back on Lincoln at uh, City Point. One of the stories that comes out of this period is Mary Lincoln having what I think anybody would call a meltdown while she's down there. Uh, she, she has, again, according to a couple of accounts, She's convinced that some young officers' wives have designs on her husband. She's not being treated like a first lady. Julia Grant is trying to treat her as an equal, for goodness sakes. She doesn't recognize she's the first lady of the land. And it's, it's one of the strongest portraits of this woman out of control that you're ever going to find. I track it back to two sources, each of whom had a each of whom were in the Grant camp. Uh, Both were aides to Ulysses S. Grant. And by the time they wrote these stories, number one, they realized that by making Mrs. Lincoln look terrible, they made Mrs. Grant look great, and that can't hurt. And number two, I think we don't recognize how vilified Mary Lincoln was in the years after the assassination. This country quickly catapults Abraham Lincoln into the, into the altar of the martyred president. A wife who is anything less than a saint is somehow demeaning that uh, reputation. And Mary Lincoln, I'm not claiming she was uh, a normal person, but she was also no saint. And she stood up for herself. She fought for her pensions from Congress. She, did all the sorts of things that I think proper America felt was really uh, throwing dirt on the memory of Abraham Lincoln. So when these two guys came to write their memoirs of Lincoln's visit to City Point, they just piled it on her. And uh, again, it's something you're going to have to handle carefully. Gettysburg approach, Gettysburg is what I think I can safely say, and I I think it's a word that's overused, but Gettysburg is clearly an iconic event of the Civil War. And my definition of iconic comes from, I had the pleasure of talking to a history honors class at uh, Montgomery High School in uh, Maryland. These are smart kids, uh, good history students, not necessarily Civil War students. And I had to sort of flip through the flip cards and say, what names are going to create images in their minds and what names are going to leave blank stares? And to me, when you can say something and, you know, it's a little like if we were doing a cartoon version of this talk, you know, and I said Robert E. Lee, there would be little thought bubbles popping up over all of you and they wouldn't match because we each sort of absorb the character in ways that make sense to us and that's the way it fixes in our mind. 
Society for iconic events does the same thing. It uses those events for purposes that have nothing to do with just commemorating the occasion, but are often trying to sell something to the country. In the latter part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century, the big message that was being sold, and actually I was pleased to see it in one of the uh, display movies in the, in the visitor center, is reconciliation. I think you've all seen that picture of the gray guys and the blue guys shaking hands across the wall at the high water mark. That was not a spontaneous act of these gentlemen. It was on the program. It was planned for. The cameras were ready. It was expected that they would do this. And that expectation in certain areas often shapes the way the veterans remembered what happened. I want to give you a for instance, and now I'll go back two files to Sherman's March. One of the, some of the research I did on Sherman's March was to get some very well-regarded American history textbooks, overall histories, and see how they treated Sherman's March. And to me, it was a great way to sort of figure out what the key elements of the nationally accepted story were. And the one thing that popped out on me was, and a number of very distinguished historians basically said that for the whole course of the march, Sherman's men marched basically in sunshine, blue skies, and had a great time. And in the course of my research on the book, I came up, I utilized about 130, 140 soldier diaries. Now these are the kind of diaries that I think uh, a narrative historian will usually put aside because basically it says, got up, it was cold, we marched a lot, went to bed. I mean, not the kind of vivid language you want to quote, but I suddenly realized I had about 120 little weather stations here because these guys are reporting in, in general terms the weather. And I collated all the diaries. And lo and behold, in the course of this march, Sherman's men marched through about six days of pouring rain and two days of snow showers. Yet the story of Sherman's march, and here I think we almost, I can finally bring art into a discussion of history. I think we need to blame uh, Henry Clay work and the song Marching Through Georgia. Became a hugely popular song, and if you read it, it doesn't say sunshine, but it certainly suggests that there was nothing in the way of these boys as they marched from Atlanta to Savannah. And in fact, there was quite a lot in the way of these boys, uh, including the fact that you know Sherman had something like uh, five or 600 wagons that they had to push through the mud on those days that it rained. But to me, that just tells you that society takes the icons, the iconic events, adds something that's important to it at the time, and often that becomes the heritage that we uh, take over. And again, something I learned from Gettysburg, which is certainly filled with those iconic moments. And you have to stop and say, all right, is there a political agenda at work here? Is there a subset to this story that I need to take a, account of? Something else that Gettysburg introduced me to, and I'm a little surprised to say it wasn't the only time I've now encountered this, was something I call the faux memoirs, F-A-U-X, the French word for false memoirs. Let me recommend that if you have the time, and I think libraries still have copies, go to the library and dig out some of the 1960s era's histories of the Battle of Gettysburg. I would say that based on what you've learned in your time here and, and talking to people, you've now formed, I think, a reasonable sense of the battle. I think you will be very interested to see what parts of the story that now aren't even told raise their head and appear in those earlier books, including 
some sources that were very highly regarded as late as the 1960s. Now, for Gettysburg studies, it was a book by an artillery man in the United States artillery named Augustus Buell. He wrote a book called The Cannoneer. It's vivid, lively portrait of the action of the United States artillery on the three days of the Battle of Gettysburg. It took a professor out of Pennsylvania, as best I can track it back, who finally dug out Buell's service record. He did belong to the battery. He joined it a month after the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, what makes this all so tricky is that a lot of what he says can be corroborated from other sources. We have official reports. We have newspaper accounts. He says his battery was in action at 1 o'clock on the afternoon of July 1st. I can corroborate that for the most part. And this, to me, is, what a, is the essence of a, a faux memoir is not a fictional memoir. It's a composite memoir. The, the secret is to determine if the author had reasonable access to people who knew the story. And he did. He joined the battery a month after the battle. He talked to the guys. He got their stories. He took good notes. When I did Sherman's March, another often quoted source is a narrative of the march by a uh, reporter named Cunningham. Well, it didn't take too much digging to see that he was a very active reporter in that region. He was filing reports at the time of Sherman's march, and he was covering the Battle of Nashville. But after Nashville, he rejoins Sherman's army at Savannah and goes with it through the Carolinas. So once again, he had access to people who knew the story. And he used that access to pull facts together to create a narrative that, again, can be corroborated on a basic level. Events he says happened, happened. It's a real challenge for an author to figure out how much of I would guess there's some authors who would sh simply take the book, put it in the closet, and never look at it again. I like to think that there are elements in there that will rise on a careful examination and that you will realize that, well, yes, this is exactly what they could have felt and said. So you don't, in your own text, you don't put him there, but I think you can draw from it. Now, the most amazing one I've found is my, my recent work. I have to tell you that if you read books published as late as a year or two ago covering the life of Abraham Lincoln, when they deal with the two weeks from March, uh, late March to early April 1865 that he's at City Point, Virginia, you're going to see extensive quotations from a fellow named William H. Crook. He published a couple articles about 20 years after, basically presenting himself as Lincoln's bodyguard. In the narrative, made it clear that he walked, he was behind, you know, 10 feet behind Lincoln wherever he went during that time there. And I'm not going to pick a fight with some very good historians who have utilized Crook. Uh, again, as recently as a couple of years ago. I was not the first historian to note the fact that all the other witnesses to Lincoln's visit to City Point don't mention Crook. Now again, a guy who supposedly is standing right over there all the time, you think somebody would have mentioned him. No one mentions him. I did some digging. And actually, at uh, Georgetown University, there was uh, papers of a collector of Lincoln memorabilia. And I found a letter from a clerk who worked with Crook 25 years afterwards. He called the man an inherent liar who lives on his presumed association with Abraham Lincoln. Well, that added to the case. Then I just really lucked onto the Crook article first appeared, the Crook pieces. Another important point I noticed, Crook 
is, exist in three forms. Uh, two articles that appeared in the Washington Post, uh, expanded articles that appeared in Scribner's Magazine, something like that, and then chapters of a book he published called Through Five Administrations. Every one of them is as told to. I think you know the style. Most, most often it's a sports memoir. You know, your favorite jock tells a story of his life and you realize it's, he's telling it to someone else who's telling it to you. And that's the case it was with Crook. But right after the newspaper articles appeared, a fellow who was there at the time named Charles Forbes, and if you look up Lincoln and the Lincoln White House and look Forbes up, he's real, he's there. He wrote an immediate letter to the Washington Post and said, Crook was not there when they left in March. I was. And to me, that completely demolished Crook as, as a reliable source. So thanks to Gettysburg and the cannoneer, I really became aware of. And then again, the critical element always is going to be, can you trace a likely track? And actually, as Forbes tells it, Mary Lincoln has her so-called meltdown. She comes back to Washington literally turns around because when she gets there, they're saying, hey, do you hear the news? We captured Richmond. So she gets back on a boat and comes back. He says Forbes came back with her. So I think that starts the process by which he got all the stories that he used in his memoirs. And again, pick up any biography of Lincoln and look in the index for Crook, and I believe you'll find him quoted. And to be fair, two of my earlier books also used him that way before I knew better. But I, I'm guilty of that as well. Um, my work on Lee, really, I, you know, when I, I'll, I'll make some more confessions here. It'll probably be embarrassing, I guess. When I did my first studies on the Overland Campaign and Petersburg, I believe that if you understood the actions of the commander prior to the battle and during the battle, you've done your work. I now realize you really got to look at what happens after the battle to this person to understand some of what they might have done during the battle. And uh, doing this on, on Lee really, in a way, you can see this was like a book of a series, and they had a very fixed format. I had a very limited number of words. So that's fine. I cut out all the poetry and just got down to the facts. But I'm more convinced than ever that Lee, the course of Lee's career during the Civil War can be best understood as understanding his changing sense of personal mission. I believe that Lee was the kind of man who threw himself entirely into an assignment and created a mission that he felt he could achieve. And when he's called and actually, you know, kind of raises his hand and says, I'm here, take me, take me. When he's called to command the armies of the Confederacy in Virginia in 1862, he believes very much that what his role is is to bring the Union Army to a climatic battle, defeat it so decisively that it will force a peace conference. So uh, some, some call it the Battle of Annihilation. I believe you can best understand Lee on July 2nd and 3rd, understanding that that's what he was trying to, to find here. To me, the critical document on Lee comes in August of 1863 when he writes his resignation to Jefferson Davis. Now, Lee, you know, there's some, like Beauregard, I can bet more than one said, that's it, I quit. Not Lee, this is not Lee to do this. This is a measured, powerfully personal response to a situation. Lee, and let me parse this very carefully. Lee never believed he lost the Battle of Gettysburg. He believed he was unable to deliver the victory 
that he felt the Confederacy needed. Lee believed, and, and this is where this book came in handy, because I was so limited in, in scope that what I had to do was tell the entire military story from Lee's perspective. I didn't give the Union guys two minutes of time. What Lee saw, what he imagined the situation was, what the information that was coming to him was. And look, on the morning of July 3rd, he, A, doesn't realize how badly beat up Longstreet's Corps is, doesn't realize the managerial chaos going on in Ewell's Corps at the time. And you read the first of, he wrote three reports of the Battle of Gettysburg, which tells me he's trying to figure out what the heck happened. And uh, it's in the first one, I think, that he says very clearly, he says, the plan on the third day was the same as the second. Fold in the, the flanks, and they're done. And the process that follows, in a way, I drew from my years at NPR of sitting down at management meetings that sort of wound up going where no one wanted them to go. Lee started the meeting saying, when are we going to do this to find out they couldn't do this? And then began the negotiation. I, I think a lot of historians miss the fact. I mean, you read some of the histories and it's like, he woke up in the morning, he saw that clump of trees, and he said, that's where we're going. Uh-uh. He had this, you know, Trust me, if you ever see a book that says, you know, management secrets for Robert E. Lee at Gettysburg, don't, don't buy that book. From my point of view, it's one of the worst managed battles I've ever seen. And look, just read, on the second day, just read the official reports. The idea of this on echelon attack after uh, Longstreet's Corps went in. Each brigadier had a whole different idea of what they were supposed to do. A non-echelon attack means when the guy to your side goes forward, you wait and then follow. Well, some of the guys said, the guy goes forward and I'll wait to see if he needs any help. And one guy at the very end of the line said, I wasn't supposed to go forward at all. And it's, to me, that just tells you that the process of communicating and understanding through the chain of command was so terribly flawed at Gettysburg that any you know, anything Lee imagined, I think. And again, taking when I look at Pickett's charge, I say, let's start with the assumption that Lee knew exactly what he was doing. And where does that lead us? And when you parse that action apart, you realize he made a whole series of little decisions. It wasn't just line them up and charge. And it wasn't just Alexander, shoot off all your cannon, and then the boys will charge. Alexander had a second mission. He was to move forward, get it just a little ahead of the line when it reached the Emmitsburg Road, and blast the Union position. Lee understood that last hundred yards was going to be the killer. He had a crossfire set up with the cannon, but nobody in Ewell's Corps understood their part of the plan. A few joined in the bombardment, a few stayed out but they had an opportunity to really catch some of the Union infantry and, and uh, cannon in a, in a really deadly crossfire. And they just didn't understand that was part of the plan. It was a good plan that just fell apart on every level. And that ultimately, again, it's like, I'm a great fan of, of airplane disaster movies and airplane disaster documentaries because they're almost always, a screw comes out, something shakes loose, it falls into something, it sets it on fire, it burns some wires, it starts this happening, and the plane comes down. If any one of those didn't happen, the plane would keep flying. Lee set up a very careful balance of decisions that would have maximized his chance for success, and they all collapsed. And as a result, it failed. Lee, after his resignation letter, is turned back by Jefferson Davis. And this is where a case where I'm going to throw this out there. Now, look, 
I come from Washington, D.C., where you can express an opinion without having an opinion. I believe a very good case could be made that the way the Battle of Gettysburg ended added at least six months to the Civil War. Because when Lee, if Lee had won, war would have been over by 64. If Meade had decisively acted and, and gone aggressively after Lee and really wrecked the Army of Northern Virginia, the war would have been over by 1864. But what happens? Lee has to find another way, another mission for himself. And he decides that his mission, how am I doing? Okay. He decides that an, his new mission would be to confuse and disrupt enemy plans. He is now buying time for a political process, ultimately resting on the northern election uh, in the fall of 1864, to bring negotiations forward and to have a peace between the North and the South. So he is then acting on an offensive, de I'm sorry, in a defensive offensive mode. This kind is guaranteed to maximize casualties on both sides. And when you look at the casualty list from the Overland campaign, it's, they are horrendous. And ultimately, even though his army is very badly uh, suffering in itself in this campaign, it holds together, he maintains his lines during the winter of 1864, and he brings us into the spring of 1865. Had Lee not come out of Gettysburg and been forced to change his mission, I think he would have maintained the high-risk style he had been used up to that point. And I just can't believe that, with, with, especially if Grant comes east, that he could have survived in that mode. But by the time Grant comes east, Lee is in a defensive-offensive mode. Hold him back, strike when there's an opportunity, pull back becomes the mantra of the Overland campaign, and thousands of Union soldiers paid the price for that. Now, I said there were three parts of the Lee's phase. I believe that in March of 1865, Lee once again finds he's lost his sense of purpose. He has a meeting with Jefferson Davis where Davis makes it clear there's going to be no negotiation for peace. Davis is not prepared to put on the table anything. Southern, you know, they could probably have gotten the moon as long as they gave up Southern independence. But Davis was not prepared to put that on the table. And he felt that the Southerners would rally to the cause and we had this 11th hour success. Lee understood that was not going to happen. Something about the patrician quality of the man prevented him from taking Jefferson Davis by the lapels, shaking him, and saying, are you crazy? Nathan Bedard Forrest would have done that, but not Robert E. Lee. And that's why I believe another longer talk I give is that um, you look at the decisions Lee makes in the Appomattox campaign and you realize he's setting himself up. He's putting himself in a corner. And I believe the main reason Appomattox is another of those iconic moments is because it's so perfect. You can say it's all, they couldn't have staged it any better. And I would argue that I think Lee did play a role in staging that. And that's, to me, the three, three parts of Lee's career. I have a, a final wrap up here because in the tease, I wanted to talk a little bit about film, and I'll, I'll do that now. I'm a fan of Civil War films, and one of my favorites is The Horse Soldiers with John Wayne and William Holden. It's unabashed fiction, but based loosely on uh, Grierson's raid in support of Grant's Vicksburg campaign. Early in the film, there's a scene on board Grant's headquarters on board some naval vessel, and he gives what looks like a suicide mission to John Wayne and expresses the hopes that he won't be captured 
He says, because if you will, they're going to send you Andersonville, and I hear that's a hellhole. Well, I like the film a lot, but I always wondered, why did they get that little fact wrong right at the beginning of the film? Andersonville doesn't become active until 1864. He could have said Cahaba, Alabama, or Belle Island, Virginia, but I realized that screenwriters, if they want to make a point with and you are not a typical audience that would be sitting in front of some of these films. There would be a lot of people in the audience who don't know half of what you know about the Civil War. But they got to make that point that there's great danger for the hero. And if he gets captured, it's going to be terrible. And what can they use? They use Andersonville. Because they understand that will penetrate even people who hated history in, in class. I recently saw the very historically accurate film, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. <laughs> I wasn't disappointed. But look, when it came to the moment in the film where they had to show the ultimate battle of good and evil, the battle on which the fate of the world relied on, they needed one word that would tell that to an audience. And they found that word, and the word was Gettysburg. And to me, that tells us as long as those filmmakers are still pulling that one, it's going to remain central to the American experience. Thank you very much. Okay? Minute over, sorry. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting uh, talk. Um, <clears throat> In reading your book on Gettysburg, I noticed you didn't have any trouble uh, questioning Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and why he would say, like, he was able to execute a right... The swinging door. Yeah, the swinging door, right. how smoothly that must have worked, you know, when you're in the right. midst of uh, the fog of war, the, all that combat. Mm -hmm. But can you think of other prominent people, you know, that we think of in, in Gettysburg? We a lot of, a lot of uh, colorful people involved in Gettysburg. But, you know, like maybe James Longstreet, just things you question when you, when you write about something like Gettysburg. Well, that's a big topic. Um, you know, really, I, would st I always start from Lee's report, and anything that doesn't match it, I have to sort of figure out. And, and I'm, Lee was not, they knew that an official report could eventually show up in the newspapers. So they were always writing, knowing that was going to happen. I mean, and Lee, probably because the, he's always deep in enemy territory, figured his couriers would get grabbed. But I would say Lee, you know, Anything that didn't match with Lee, I needed to sort out why it didn't match. And either there was a problem there he didn't understand, or someone is purposely hiding it. I mean, I talked about Freeman. I mean, Freeman believes in the, uh, the July 3rd morning attack order. And no one even, and again, advanced books in the 70s had to argue against it. Now we don't even mention it, because we know it wasn't true. So that, that, that's part of the mix there. I don't know that fully answers it, but I sort of get, get you towards it. Anybody else? Well, I've stunned them with my brilliance. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>